Hello, everyone. Um, okay, we're going to get started here. We're at session 1A. You've never had it so low. Good. You've never had it so low. Good. Excuse me. Managing sustainability and scalability with successful artful collaborations. And to speak today are Autumn Johnson from Georgia Southern University and Ann E. Merriman from University of South Carolina Upstate. So this session will introduce two lone rangers um, faced with highly successful yet outsized collaborative projects that place unexpected demands on time and resources. They require the archivist to consider ways to manage sustainability, scalability, and assessment of their collections and work going forward. So uh, without further ado, here we go. Thank you. Nope, I'm going to actually if I talk this up, can you guys hear me in the back? I'm, I'm a hand talker and a microphone that would just be a weapon in my hand. So I don't, <laughs> want, to, I don't want to do that. But if, if one of our voices starts to lay low, just let us know. Yeah, we'll, we'll speak up. Um, so thank you all for coming this morning. It's kind of exciting for me to be the first session. Usually when I present at conferences, I'm in the last session on the last day. So this is like new territory for me. Um, again, my name is Ann Merriman, and this session is called You've Never Had It Solo Good, Managing Sustainability and Scalability with Successful Archival Collaborations. And I'm here today with my colleague, Autumn Johnson, um, as we were introduced, so thank you for joining us. Um, our session today is going to describe two separate projects that both incorporated innovative ways uh, to work with our faculty and community stakeholders to teach using primary source materials while simultaneously allowing students to develop their technical skills and career relevant experience. Um, the, ses the session is also going to uh, talk about how we've broken out of, broken out of our traditional siloed um, nature of our loan arranger tasks of me and an academic, academic archivist to build these strong partnerships. And we hope that the individual projects can, um, you guys find that to be easily replicated on your campus or at your institution. Um, but overall, we hope that you might take away some strategies if you are a loan arranger for how you might manage really successful uh, projects that have just exploded. So we've got some learning outcomes for this session. Um, by the end of this presentation, we hope that you'll be able to, again, as Autumn said, identify strategies for managing these, these large or complicated or possibly outsized projects. Um, we want you to be able to understand the role of scalability in your project um, design and project planning, and that you will be able to examine ways in which um, to define and measure the success or impact of a popular or in-demand project. Um, also to begin to develop um, methods for replicating similar projects on your own campuses. And as Autumn said, it may not be this, you know, the projects that we have per se, because everybody's projects are individual, but the process by which we kind of entered into these projects and, and have sort of navigated our way through that. We hope that that will be instructive and helpful for you as we go through this. We thought it important to describe a little bit about ourselves and our institution, but before we start, a show of hands, who considers himself a loan arranger in this room? Okay, all right. So there's still some minority in the room. Okay, so uh, again, uh, my name is Autumn. I'm from Georgia Southern University. So we are stretched across all three campuses, kind of Savannah, Hinesville, and Statesboro, the largest of which the main campus is Statesboro. So we do consider ourselves kind of in a rural community. We are a large institution. We are an R2 institution. Uh, we have 24,000 students. Uh, now, despite our size, um, I still consider myself a lone arranger, actually probably a half arranger. I, my title is Special Collections Librarian, but I have dual roles as a RSD, like Research Services Librarian. So I do traditional information literacy instruction and reference work. I liaison with four different units, history, criminal justice, school of human ecology, and Irish studies. So again, kind of a half arranger. I do fortunately have one full-time staff person. Um, they are not an archivist or librarian by trade, so very much a paraprofessional position. And we are supported by student staff, both paid and unpaid in the form of volunteers and interns. 
In my uh, special collections unit, we have been somewhat underutilized over the past couple of decades. We've seen some significant growth in the past four or five years since I've been there, um, but we're not as well known on campus as I really hope to be. And um, I am from the University of South Carolina Upstate. It is part of the South Carolina University system. We're located in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, of the system campuses that are not the main campus, we are the largest of those three regional campuses. We have about 5,800 students. Um, and like Autumn, um, I am also a dual role um, archivist. I liaison as a uh, reference and instruction librarian. Um, my departments are history, political science, and military history. So I feel like both of us kind of exemplify the, the I don't know, it's a Dr. Seuss story about the kid who wore all the hats, right? He's got the big stack of hats. I feel like that's what I, I live sometimes. Um, I'm the first trained archivist at USC Upstate. Our institution is 55 years old this year, so our archives are really um, infancy stage. Um, there wasn't anybody who kind of was overseeing any sort of archival process on campus before I was hired eight years ago. Um, I also consider myself to be a Lone Ranger, even though I do have one full-time staff, they are not a librarian or trained archivist as well. So they're very much paraprofessional and they know how to do what I have trained them to do so far. Um, so that's kind of a big mountain to climb. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced the same in your institutions. I do have one part-time staff. I draw from our adjunct librarian pool. Um, she has a significant amount of archival experience. She is a trained librarian and archivist, so I lean very heavily on her when I have her. She um, works with me 11 hours a week. Um, and again, since we're such a young institution and I'm the first archivist, the archives are really not very well known on our campus either. Um, so like Autumn, I face kind of that, that issue as well. So Anna and I have had a lot of conversations about this dual role, but these successful projects that we've managed to have despite our lack of uh, staff support. Um, so in general, our previous approach to collaboration or in interactions with our university as well as our greater community have been somewhat limited. I think typically if we do have those engaged with our resources, it does follow that kind of typical one-shot session where a faculty member has already chosen a collection or some primary source materials and kind of do a petting zoo activity. Uh, for both of us, that has varied considerably and we've really tried to encourage our faculty and our users to think of other ways to potentially use our collections. And so over the years, we both have developed these small projects that are mutually beneficial, that can add value to our stakeholders, the faculty, and really kind of upping their teaching and how they might incorporate more experiential learning and incorporate primary source literacy into their classes. Um, but of course, mutually beneficial in helping us create awareness of what we do and what's in our collection. And with both of us, these small projects have really built kind of a slow build and increasingly we're seeing them become more complex and those relationships getting stronger. Um, the projects that we're going to describe today are kind of a culmination of those efforts. So both of these projects represent kind of an array of different stakeholders and partners. And it's all about for us improving our overall accessibility and discoverability of the collections in our care. So like we just previously described, Lone Ranger archivists are characterized by very small staff size, often with only one other person. Um, they might be the only professional archivist on staff, depend on the expertise of paraprofessionals in the case of both of us. Um, there's rotating pools of students or interns. I wish I kind of had some interns. I, I feel like that would be, well, it's a, it's a manage the process, but I kind of wish I could have an intern. Um, and in some cases, it might be truly a solo Lone Ranger situation. It might just be you. So... Why is it a good thing to break silos? All that happens when you break a silo is the grain falls out or the missile falls over. <laughs> Neither of which are a good thing. Or maybe once you break out of your silo, you discover opportunities for expansion and innovation far beyond what you imagined you would be capable of as a lone arranger. 
So I want to take a deeper look um, first at my project. Um, so I have a collaboration with a professor of German. It was between his German 311 Introduction to Translation course and the archives. He was approached by a private collector out of North Carolina, Mr. Brad Hugh, who collects um, documentation in German language um, from World War II era. And most of his collection consists of Nazi propaganda. Um, and so he wanted a way to uh, provide a, an avenue for this material to be understood by non-native German language speakers. And so he contacted uh, Dr. Lorenz, who's our professor of German, and wanted to see if um, he could get some students if students could translate some of his materials. Um, again, like I said, this collection in, is mostly propaganda, but there are several letters written from prisoners who were at different concentration camps um, around Germany and the surrounding areas. Um, there's a collection of ballots, and there's also some materials um, that describe the seizure of financial assets and property by the Nazis during this time. Um, so the faculty, Dr. Lorenz, he approached me and wanted to know if I could digi digitize these materials so that his students could work with them. That was really the extent of what he wanted, but when he told me about this, I recognized that there was really an opportunity to create an online digital collection where researchers could access this material, right? So if we're going to make it um, accessible to English language speakers, it really needs to be somewhere where, where somebody can access and, and read it. And he didn't think about that at the, at the beginning. Um, so the collaboration um, between us, I provided the technical training and guidelines to his students in the form of like, what does, how do you format um, a uh, translated document? Like what, how do I need to see that so that then I can use it when I attach it to my digital collection? How do you do file names? I mean, I don't know about you guys, I'm sure everybody here has like struggled with the please name files in this consistent way. And then you get them and they're named a bunch of gobbledygook. And then I had to go back in and fix a lot of that. Um, but um, his, uh, the, the teaching faculty's role was really for monitoring all of the translation accuracy and keeping the project on track during the semester because it was a semester long class and that was it. Um, the collector for his part, um, he created or was able to facilitate $1,000 scholarships for each of the students that were in this course. They were founded through the Dell Corporation. That's who um, Brad Lucky works for. Um, so it was actually another way to help support the work of these students and it exemplified for them kind of um, a more realistic what you would be doing if you were a professional translator right you would be paid for your work and this is kind of how it how it happened so um, unfortunately not all items in the collection were able to be completed during the semester so there's a few items that currently remain untranslated one of the magazines um, and a couple of the um, ballots are not translated. So what made this partnership significant? Um, this course delivered hands-on professional training as a translator. There's a lot of talk in academia, uh, academia about high impact practices. And this was really an opportunity for the archives to support our teaching faculty in creating one of these HIP processes. Um, these students created this content for a, a digital collection um, it has significant historic and research value. Um, and this collaboration between myself and Dr. Lorenz was a really good example um, to the entire campus of how the archives can support them in their, um, you know, the, again, these sort of hands-on, these real world experiences, like what can the archives, how can we um, partner with teaching faculty and really support them? Um, this is an example of one of the translated items out of the review collection. Um, the translation got cut off on the bottom, um, but uh, Dawson Adams was one of the students in the first cohort of German translation students, that is who did this. Um, and you can see, so 
When you look at this collection, I, let me say this collection is housed at the South Carolina Digital Library, scmemory.org. You'll see the link at the end. Um, but the collection, when you look at it there, the translation um, is a, it's not in this format. It's actually in a text format because that's the way um, the, the platform works with that. But um, this was a, so on the right, that was an example of how the translations were coming to me. And so to, I had to convert that. I had to do the work then on the end to convert that into just a text document. So it meant I had to take that put it into a Word document without all the fussy stuff and then convert it to text document to be able to upload it into content. So Brad McHugh World War II collection un underway going along and then there were two. <laughs> so then Dr. Lorenz approached me. Um, we, he was contacted by a private family in May of 2020, the pandemic year, which is like, seems like a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a collection of letters that they had and they were searching for translate um, Holocaust documents and they found a press release about the Bradley Few collection. And so that's how we um, were contacted by this family. Um, this collection is also really interesting um, so I've got to read a little bit of this, so I apologize. So what it, this collection does, it's documenting the separation, imprisonment, and reuni reunification of Samuel Finkel, his wife, Laura, and his daughter, Phyllis. They lived in Vienna during the Anschluss, which is the annexation of Austria um, in 1938. Samuel was a merchant. Various sources have him listed as a bicycle merchant, um, but he... Um, did some, he was some sort of a business owner. Samuel was imprisoned in Vienna by the Nazis in March of 1939. He was then deported to the United Kingdom. He was first interred at the Kitchener camp, which is in Richborough, Kent. He was then moved to the Isle of Man. And then from there, he was transported to Australia. He was interred first in Hay, and then later in Tatura camp. And then he was released and he worked in a wool factory in Melbourne. His daughter Phyllis was sent to the United States as part of the 1000 children transport that were unaccompanied minors. They um, were to be sponsored in some way by family members, relatives, something. Um, so she went in March of 1940 and she was eventually reunited with Samuel in September of 1946. She first went to San Francisco to live with an aunt and then she was moved in and out of foster homes um, after about a year. Not super clear on why that happened. So her mother, Samuel's wife, Laura, she was unable to find a sponsor of her own to escape the Nazi occupation. She was detained in May 1941, and she was sent to Nordhausen, which is a subcamp of Dor Dora Middlebau, where she worked as field labor. She was there for about a year. She was returned to Vienna in May 1942, where she was then sent to Mali Trostenitz extermination camp in Minsk, and she died there. So that's the that's the second collection. So we get this new collection and then it adds on these additional challenges. So what about the timeline? What about the workload? Both of those become exponentially more complicated now that I'm dealing with the second collection. So in summer 2020, I had to scan and prepare 142 new images that belong to the Samuel Finkel collection. And at that same time, I was working um, on finishing up the metadata and the background research for the Brad McHugh collection. In 2021, I was able to get the Brad McHugh collection published in the South Carolina Digital Library and the German translation course, which is only taught every other year in the fall semester, was going to be going forward again. So they were going to be working on the Samuel Finkel documents. So I had to then update and reevaluate the um, guidelines and um, processes for the students. And here we are then in 2022, the Samuel Finkel collection, while it has been translated from the student standpoint, um, the publication, uh, the publishing of that collection is 
been delayed. I was also involved in an NEH grant, um, Landmarks grant that we were able to finally put on in the summer of 2022. That planning was going on for three years. Um, yay, pandemic. Um, so the metadata and the translation file conversion is still in process um, at this time for this paper collection. So what initially I, I envisioned as a project that was fairly straightforward and I could get it online has now really morphed into this hydra beast that I'm having a hard time controlling. So for the, the takeaways, so for the design and, and goals, um, this course goal was really for um, Dr. Lorenz was to develop um, students' translation skills um, using primary source German language documents. Um, my goal was I wanted a permanent digital collection. So again, as I said, the faculty, uh, Dr. Lorenz, he provided the translation verification and he made sure that uh, the project kind of kept moving forward in a timely way. Um, but I had to provide um, troubleshooting technical support when they had images that they then could not open. Obviously, we always run across a few of those, had to re um, refix those, those images. So really my arc load, uh, my workload was heaviest before the semester. So working with him to kind of get everything set up. And then after um, the semester is over, like taking all of the um, data and the information that the students created and then dealing with that. So I was kind of hands off during the semester, but both sides. Um, the outcome was obviously um, a unique digital collection. It is um, accessible. South Carolina Digital Library is open access. You can get to it anywhere. Um, benefit, and I think a lot of state digital archives are like this. Um, the Digital Public Library of America harvests a CDL. So I think that um, we that collection's been harvested. I think you can get through it to, through DPLA. Um, and then the second project um, developed from um, having uh, media press releases and having that project um, being published. Um, challenges, definitely I underestimated the workload for preparing dual language metadata. I don't speak German. Mm -hmm. So it's been interesting. A lot of the documents too were written, um, particularly for the Brad LePew collection, they were written in black letter, which is really hard to figure out if it's an F or an S or an L. Um, so it involved a whole lot of work on the back end to try to figure some of this out. Uh, these collections were fairly large, so it means that there are some untranslated items remaining actually in both collections. We're trying to figure out a way, um, is there a process that we can get the rest of those? Maybe it's a senior seminar independent study, we can get some of those done. Um, there were unexpected formatting issues like you saw in the picture. I had to then take, um, you know, the, the first semester uh, cohort of students wanted to make it all pretty and make it look kind of in a Word document like, um, you know, what they were seeing on the actual item. And that's, you can't upload that. And I didn't realize that at the time. So that was part of my, oh, let's, let's revamp. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, the course is taught um, in the fall semester once every other year. So that kind of impedes things um, and new article projects. Uh, so now we're going to take a deeper look into my project, but you're going to notice some similar beats between kind of balancing out my mini hats and a project is really taking off. Um, so I'm going to be discussing our efforts to support student content creation using special collections, primarily through a platform called Look Guides. Um, show of hands who has access to Look Guides at their institution. Okay, so about half. Um, so for those of you unfamiliar, LibGuide and LibGuide CMS are spring share products that allow traditionally librarians to easily make web guides and websites. Uh, traditionally, we use these for information path funders for specific subjects or courses. Um, we have access to LibGuide CMS. One of the main benefits of utilizing CMS, if you don't have access yet, is the ability to customize the look and feel of the platform 
And it, it really integrates well with most learning management uh, systems and we're able to save content as assets. Um, because of the capability of the platform, many of the librarians at my institution are increasingly using them in non-conventional, more creative ways. Um, in special collections, we've used the platform for a number of years since I arrived about five years ago. So we use LibGuys as a platform to create digital exhibitions. We also use it to create digital components of physical exhibitions. And so this allows kind of greater visibility to the overall collection. In some cases, their research that's undergone and the development of the finding aid and the processing. Um, LibGuys, again, if you don't have access, has some really powerful search indexing capabilities. And so we've seen a lot of interest in the collections that we have highlighted using LibGuides. Um, we do host our digit digitized content elsewhere. We host it in our open repository, um, Depress. Um, but there are limitations with that platform. And the LibGuide allows us to kind of bring together um, a variety of different resources. It's visually more appealing. We can do a bit more with it. Our team of students have been probably the, the biggest proponents of using this. They're very engaged with this process. Um, they have curated our digital exhibitions over the past couple of years, obviously working closely with myself. And it must be said that most of our student employees, so we have graduate assistants, um, two graduate assistants, um, and then usually we have some kind of undergraduate and graduate intern. Most of them are going to be coming from our history department. Specifically, they're going to be on the public history track. Um, and that's important to realize because as part of their master's program, they actually are required to have some kind of digital component with their final project. Mm -hmm. So obviously they're very invested um, in the project. Mm -hmm. So again, kind of going back, speaking about my colleagues, um, there has been a real growing relationship with the various librarians who wear different hats in their own capacities to work with faculty to create content on the platform beyond just those pathfinders. And so um, my colleagues, particularly Ruth Baker and Dr. Mortimer, who I will cite at the end of the presentation, and it got cut off here, I'm sorry, uh, were kind of the first to do this, working specifically with the digital humanities cohort. So they kind of saw the advantage of hosting a variety of patron-driven content on the platform while simultaneously protecting the library's interest and controlling access to the patient generated content. So if you're interested in the technical aspects or how we set up any of this, um, that article is really helpful. And of course, we ask questions at the end. Um, so when I arrived at Georgia Southern, I actually inherited this digital humanities cohort. And so in another capacity, um, I started working with this particular faculty member to transform uh, what they were doing with Love Guides. So as you kind of can see from this example, they were creating um, mock examples of digital humanities projects uh, that just kind of existed out of their own minds. But we slowly started to get them to think about it in terms of, okay, could we do something real? Could we do something with our special collections materials? And so in 2020, in the great before, the, this spring semester, <laughs> Um, I worked with a faculty to kind of curate this digital exhibition of a selection of our pre-1650 rare book collections. And so it was the faculty who was already comfortable with the platforming, but now utilizing special collections material in a mutually advantageous way. So there was a precedent for working with history faculty. Um, kind of take a step back once again, simultaneous to this, these graduate students are creating these types of digital projects. But more often, they're not hosted on a LibGuide or some kind of platform that the library creates. In fact, most often, they're on WordPress sites, Google sites, and Weebly. And even though they are publicly available, discoverable, even through the departmental website, they're not readily maintained and updated post-graduation. Um, so again, great work. But as you can see, most of the links are broken, and, and things are just not um, kept up with. Other students in my short time at Georgia Southern, I've realized have created history. So those involved in um, creating oral histories, going out in the community and gathering those interviews, they've actually done their digital project in the form of fixed storage media. So it only exists on a flash drive. 
We had a student who went and indexed our historic Bullet County newspapers looking for references to uh, African American experience, right? Pre 1950, only exists on a flash drive. And so sometimes those flash drives would find their way to me, other times it would only be mentioned. So there certainly was um, a potential for maybe curating this in a more meaningful way so special collections could potentially use this history creation in the future. Okay. So, so began kind of the start of working with individual graduate students. Um, so I put in spring 2020, because this is when all the action happened, but I would say in fall, some graduate students started to approach me about using the LibEx platform. The first of those would be our actual students. So um, again, Alyssa um, did her project on the Women's Auxiliary Corps. She was actually doing an independent study with us. She was looking at our Roxy Renly papers. She was actually facilitating that donation with me. Um, so she asked, well, hey, I know we're not doing an exhibit yet, but can I use this for my digital requirement? She already had most of the technical skill built, so why not? It's mutually advantageous. I could again, draw greater attention to this new acquisition that we have, and it also is going to provide greater context. Um, simultaneous with that, our graduate assistant, Tyler Hendricks, was utilizing our collection, not, not as directly, but was utilizing some Francis Harper photographs in his research about mules. So again, he wanted, he already knew the platform and he wanted to use the look guide. In fact, I do have to say that Tyler became kind of the evangelist in his cohort is saying how great these look guide tools actually were beyond just telling you where to find the library's catalog. And so it really exploded in 2020 in that early semester. Um, where people outside of kind of my immediate supervisory capacities were really interested in using it. So in addition to those two, we had four others, so it's a total of six, that uh, reached out to me directly and wanted some information on how they, they can use the platform. And in some cases, it actually, again, kind of turned around, and their topics were exploring things that we actually have collections on. And so kind of wearing both of my hats, I saw the benefit of providing support for these projects, um, as well as the others that eventually came. All right, and here's another example, African Americans in Burke County, Georgia. Um, so, we, yeah, so we basically uh, figured things out as we went. So I kind of divided um, into three separate roles, right? For myself, I would be responsible for conducting training with the students and I was grouping the faculty advisors to provide them an overview of how to use LibGuide, how to edit them. I was the one assigning permission and explaining them how to use that particular platform. Um, I was also the one that would help convey what our standards were um, for the university libraries, what roles we have to maintain, um, but then also what we know as information professionals, what is metadata, what is tagging, um, why we add subjects to that. Um, simultaneously, because as we get into what their role was, I was also working with them to educate them on how they can share information in a public forum. How do we cite images? When do we attribute images? When can you use archival sources that Henderson Library Special Collection Zones? And when can you use or can you other archival sources that you've brought in. So it became kind of like this kind of growing thing where they were learning more about how to use effectively and ethically their resources to educate the public and to convey their research, but also kind of strengthening their awareness of what I do in special collections, what I have, but what our profession does. So their role was generally the content creation of the LibGuides, and we we were very adamant, or I was very adamant, that it was going to be based off of their original research analysis of the work they were doing. Again, they have to adhere to university guidelines. That's probably most in the area of kind of copyright, ethical roles, but also accessibility is really important to our institution. And I did make sure that they attend at the time one look guide training station, one look guide training station face to face, so they could really develop familiarity with the platform where I could witness it. We also added in a third component behind the scenes. I was working with the chair of the history department and the person who oversees the public history cohort to make sure that they were all on board of this platform. And I was adamant that the committee advisor chair was on board with this as well. So they had to seek their permission to use it. And ultimately, I made them responsible for reviewing the accuracy of the content, a kind of alleviating any burden on the libraries or special collections of making sure that the original research was accurate and authoritative, because our name was on it in some way. 
Okay. Now we have graduate students, more evangelists going out there saying what how great this platform is. It's really intuitive. It's really easy to understand. I learned it in one session. It's also really discoverable. And so the faculty advisors and other faculty started to hear about it. So within the same semester, we had faculty interested in using it in their classes. So I had two separate faculty members request that we create digital exhibits in, um, using their students and using their research in special collections in that same semester. And again, it came about because it was just kind of rolling down the hill, these students were really interested in it. So we had um, one project with an undergraduate course, History of Mexico course, where they looked at, again, our rare book collection, our late 19th and early 20th century Mexican printed materials. Um, and so they were responsible for basically taking one piece, researching it in depth and creating a digital exhibition. Simultaneously, we had a history of the South course. Um, I didn't get reach, um, the faculty didn't reach out to me until about mid semester, but I can't say no. Um, and wanted to do something similar, looking at the history of the institution. So each student was responsible or kind of adopted a building on campus, which is really, you know, has been in our USG news for those of you in the system. And so they had to do research on the founding of their building as well as their namesake. So in that case, we were pulling out 10 to 12 different personal papers collections that we had, and the students were responsible for that content. Okay. Likewise, and I can show you guys specifics again, we had specific roles. My role, of course, was to be a facilitator, to add permissions, to do all the technical work, to train the students on the platform, and to hopefully train the faculty on the platform. As part of the course integrated projects, we built in both informa general information literacy instructions, and we did special collections instructions. With the Tracing Mexico, we actually had the students in our processing space because we're a small, small unit. And we had them have three different sessions where they were actually handling their objects. And then we also had information literacy sessions where we were making sure that they had the tools and the abilities to actually research their pieces. So mutually beneficial for me as both a special collections librarian seeing my collections get used, but also as the info lit librarian getting all those really classes that went beyond just a library tour. Students were responsible for the content. It, again, even though they were undergrads, they had to be based off their original research. They had to use the resources appropriately. I made them give permission to use special collections material in the formal way, just as a way to educate them that there is a process. Um, and then the instructor of record, again, was responsible for reviewing all the content ahead of making it public. So a lot of benefits to this, a lot of it are immediate. In some cases, you can immediately look at the data to show that some of these guys have thousands of views just in a semester. For those that you adhere to archives, you might even recognize Jim Crow and Savannah Parks. It recently won one of your awards. So immediate impact successful measures. Um, but overall, students were getting hands-on experience, not only with the special collections material, but also a, a, a tool, a software. Um, the first uh, young lady that you saw, Alyssa Winter, in the first slide, she kind of parlayed her experience working with LibGuides. Now she's a digital coordinator at Brown College. Um, likewise, Tyler, who was in the, one of the people in the group photo, um, now is in the middle Georgia area, also working at the archive. So able to use practical real world experience and translate that to career readiness. Um, but again, even those who aren't even at that level gained a wider appreciation and understanding of those special collections, archives, and just what we do. Um, diversity inclusion. As you guys saw, many of the topics that our graduate students in particular explored were on topics that explored um, historically marginalized groups. So while our collections, unfortunately, is not really rich in this area, we do have you know, snippets here and there. The students were able to bring things to all full together and to start conversations that we weren't having. Um, as you guys saw with the African Americans and for community outside. Um, students also developed a better understanding of the other aspects of my job. So we actually saw collections growth. So um, one of the two I did show you because they're, they chose not to make their site public looked at um, African American baseball players in the mid century. And so as part of that conversation, he did a lot of oral history interviews with surviving players. Now he is working on getting those in special collections hands. We also had another student look at care packages. He had acquired a lot of objects and a lot of materials. Then he started having uh, conversations like, oh, can I donate this to special collections? So that would have been lost history and might not have had access to. 
not all good, right? Um, so there were some challenges, the biggest one, the elephant in the room, I absolutely love my faculty, but sometimes getting the faculty on board with learning the platforms themselves and learning the technical things, they were probably a little bit more resistant to that. They obviously had their own priorities and sometimes other aspects of the project um, took their attention. It what, took a lot of my time. Not only was there that training sessions for each of the groups, but of course the classes, and then ultimately the grad students developed probably an over familiarity with myself. And so we're constantly reaching out for one-to-one -one help or very specific help. Um, and then one problem I personally um, struggled with was just creative control. I've been designing LibGuides for close to a decade now. I have my own idea of how they should look. But in order to make the platform as robust as it could be, I really needed to relinquish a lot of creative control when it came to their product that they were putting out there. Okay. So now that we've gone through all of this, we're going to shift our discussion now and begin with a few framing questions to talk about what impacts the success of these types of projects. Um, we're going to consider three areas, assessment, scalability, and sustainability. So in terms of assessment, how are you going to measure success? That's always the big question that we have, right? Um, and so one of the ways that um, it really is important to be built in is to evaluate the skills and abilities of your project partners. So in my case, um, it would be, how does my German faculty really understand what's happening on the other side of it, the flip side of the process? As Autumn mentioned, the uh, faculty needing to understand the limitations and the possibilities with LibGuides, um, just making sure that everybody has um, a, a real understanding of what you can do and what you can't do. And so you might need to bring in additional people if you find that there are some gaps or some holes in that. Um, considering what worked and didn't work at every phase of the process. Um, and of the project. So an example from mine was the whole, I didn't realize that um, the word translations were gonna have to go into another format because this was really the first project that I had ever uploaded to Content DM on my own. So I'm like, oh, surprise, now I have more work to do. Um, so definitely that informed the discussion and the planning for the phase two with the Samuel Finkel collection. Um, but uh, it's always, you know, it's imperative to always be looking like what is working and what needs to be adjusted. If you have to do it on the fly, that's one thing, but if you can avoid some of that, um, you know, it's very useful. And then being really intentional with accepting um, the, the projects, consider your role. I mean, I like the shiny thing. Right, and I want to do all these fun projects, but then I've got all the other things that I am responsible for as well. And you know, my inability to say no um, really has put me in a tight spot <laughs> multiple times. Um, so it's not that I would not take on these collections because I think that there's a real value, but um, you know, there's a there's a level of intentionality that I think we need to. Um, we need to uh, be aware of and consider. Yeah. And so as the arrangers, the third of you in the room, um, scalability becomes a huge factor. Where do we focus our effort when so much in other spheres or other aspects of what we do are also dividing our attention? Collaboration is going to be key. Are there certain aspects of the project that can be delegated to other stakeholders in the project? Um, relinquishing a lot of, again, that creative control to those groups can be key. Make those decisions about how you delegate those and the overall project um, with the idea of what long-term needs do you have in mind. And for me, that is focusing my energies on where my expertise as an archivist or a librarian is most needed, um, simply because there might be other tools or other stakeholders that we could bring into our project that can speak to other aspects of the project. Uh, to get more specific, so I was literally checking alt tags of every single image of the LibGuides. Now I thought about using third-party tools and using one of my colleagues for that. Um, don't be married to the process. So in our conversation that we talked, I used the little metaphor that someone once told me about, like we very much were flying, building the plane as we were flying it. And so we ended up having some great projects that by most markers are successful. 
but that doesn't mean that there wasn't a better way to do it. And so just because it worked in one way in one fashion, there might be another process that could save you time that can equal more success. So don't be married, don't be fixed on just because you've done it once and it's successful. And then most importantly, um, kind of coming from the construction project world, be wary of optimism bias. Um, don't unintentionally mitigate negative information and problems that you might arise in decision making to take things on. You really need to focus on what could go wrong. What are the perils? Um, I tend to not be the pessimist of my group, but maybe having a conversation with my pessimistic colleague would help me factor in some of those things that ultimately did pop up for me. And then in terms of sustainability, um, to ask yourself, why do we want to keep this project going? Do we want to keep it going? And you know, for whom are we sustaining these projects? So um, one of the things that I think about and we discussed um, at length was kind of like this low threshold of maintenance, right? So like once you get a project underway and it's going, like how hands off can I become, right? So that it still, if it's one that we are going to sustain, that it can be sustained, but that frees you up to either, um, you know, entertain the possibility of new projects or just, you know, maintain your own sanity, right? Um, People are more critical um, to sustainability than actual technology. Um, and so understanding, again, like we said at the assessment, like understanding what the strengths are of your own colleagues that you work with, if you have anybody in your department um, and your, your project partners. Um, so are they, like in my case is the German faculty, um, is he still going to be around? I believe he just earned tenure, so I'm hopeful that he's sticking around for a while. Um, but there is nobody else in that department currently that could continue this type of work. Uh, which leads me to sort of my final thought on sustainability. Um, sunsetting might be a viable option. And that doesn't necessarily mean sunsetting the entire project. It might mean sunsetting your role in the project. It could be the project as a whole, depending on what your thoughts, uh, what you kind of determine from the assessment and the scalability things. Um, but if needed, you 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 might need to just sunset the project. And as an archivist, like I get very stressed out when I think about that because I'm like, but I love it, and they want it to be around forever, and then I just can't do everything. So. That's my own problem. <laughs> uh, so keeping in the theme of the conference of practical terms and full disclosure, we both come from practical backgrounds, retail and food service. So a lot of this idea of project planning, project managing, we're spoiler taking from that area. Um, but so here are some practical takeaways that we're starting to implement um, or thinking about implement. It sounds easy, but start earlier. Draw the lines in the sand with what dates are gonna work for you. Uh, faculty and students interested in creating content or utilizing a, a platform, they, they need to let you know by what date. For me, that is a minimum now of a semester ahead of time, uh, just because it really became uncontrollable in that semester where ultimately I had eight different projects going on simultaneously, along with grant work and tenure work along the way. Um, share expectations, share written expectations with the roles, responsibilities of everyone involved. So that could be the advisor for my project, the advisor, the student, and myself, but ultimately the, pro the program coordinator needed to be in on it, the chair needed to be on it. Is there anyone else? Having those clear expectations ahead of time really going to help manage expectations and manage your workload and also create checklists and create documents that are gonna kind of guide the project overall if you can, such as the translation documents, kind of for students and for all of the stakeholders to know exactly what point, what they'll be doing. Um, schedule your time as much as possible throughout your semester, throughout your calendar year. Try to coordinate things so that there's more group training. That way you're not duplicating your efforts and taking up more of your time. Um, if one-on-one -on -one consultations will be needed, go ahead and schedule those as soon as possible at the time of training rather than on an ongoing basis. And probably the most important for us in our conversation is to be intentional. Um, think about assessment, but not only just in the terms of thinking as you're going and a more formative assessment, uh, but think about those summative assessments. Are you able to collect any data about your projects? 
great, gather that data, but also analyze that data. Um, you know, don't just collect page views. What are those page views telling you about the user and the content? Which pages are not getting views? Um, is there some kind of instrument you can create, such as a survey that you can distribute to the content creators and advisors post-project to gauge their learning or gauge their satisfaction with the project? So being more intentional with projects once they wrap up can also ultimately contribute to kind of practical terms of managing these robust projects. So we want to open this up for discussion now in the last uh, few minutes that we have. Um, we know that these types of issues arise in all sorts of institutions, and we're particularly interested in knowing about other experiences that you guys have had that are maybe similar along these lines. Um, what practical solutions have you guys had to come up with? Um, you know, what workarounds did you need to undertake? So basically this is the Q&A portion. So I have a microphone that I will Vanna White walk around. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments or just anything that you guys want to talk about. Because obviously we are really interested in how we can be a better planners when it comes to these major projects. That way we're not missing opportunities that hopefully we get us out of the archivist on our team one day. That way we have the data to support that there's continuous growth in our area, which fortunately we have experienced. But that's great personal points sometimes. Yep. So I work with a lot of people who really want to do their research, the fun stuff, and not a lot of people want to do the HTML and coding and actually make the website. I know Autumn talked a little bit about it. Um, how did you navigate that with your staff about so many staff people? How did you like, encourage them to take in that role? But specifically my staff and not the students who are choosing it? Um, either one. Okay. So Luckily, that, that is the advantage of a web guide. So if you do any kind of web design, obviously web guides is not the most robust thing you can use. But live guides is very intuitive. The Springshare community, the company that owns it, has a ton of tut video tutorials, checklists. They do one-on-one -on -one training. So it's not as arduous of a task for them to learn that platform because there's all these resources available and it's because it's really kind of foolproof. Um, and then because the graduate students were seeking me out to use the platform, I didn't have to beg them to utilize certain things. Um, now that the difficult aspect came when they were reluctant to use predetermined headings or provide alt tags, but then that just became a point of education. And we would use things like those um, plugins where we'd have a screen reader on to show just how disadvantaged some of our users could be if they didn't take these steps. And ultimately, how it can hinder the discoverability of the collection. So kind of turning it back and saying, how is it going to benefit you? Well, the better alt tags you have, the more it can lead to discoverability of your collection. So kind of showing them the advantages, but also just saying like, this is our standard in the libraries. This is what we do. When you use the platform, this is what you're going to have to do. Um, and it, obviously we didn't catch everything. It's still ongoing work, but luckily we're using LibGuides. They have link resolvers. They have things to check. So we're continuously trying to improve the accessibility. So does that answer your question? There was a question back here somewhere. Somebody ever hate this. Um, I just wonder if you would be willing to share some documentation about your use of LibGuides. We do use LibGuides within the reference departments if you're standard mm -hmm. format. So looking at the formats that y'all use are very different. So you know, anything that you have that you Share. Yeah, so I'd be happy to share that roles and responsibilities document that I initially drafted that I'm continuously improving. Um, my email is Autumn Johnson, you no, know, not my email, uh, Autumn Johnson at Georgia Southern, and we'd be happy to share this presentation, which as you guys can see, there are links and references, but also just reach out and I'll be happy to share anything um, with you all. And again, it's Springshare community, so things are easily duplicated and replicated, um, particularly if it's something that relates to a project my staff did in the capacity as being my staff. I have made those available to the community, so you can easily copy those, and it's fine. We have Creative Commons licenses on all of our LibGuides, so that helps as well. Other questions? I was wondering if either of you have 
leverage other staff within the libraries um, to uh, make make the projects more scalable. You know, uh, I don't you know on your your part time reference and special collection. So I'm, you know, I don't know whether you have other reference staff or other staff in the library that that could aid in in terms of this. So I'm fortunate because we do have a lot of librarians, they just happen to not be special collections librarian. Uh, I would say Jeffrey Mortimer, he's our discovery services librarian. So probably the colleague I consulted the most if someone had a question about how to customize or if we needed a, a, a CSS sheet, he could quickly whip that up. But also Springshare could help too. So for example, um, Jeffrey Offgate's project, he wanted a visible public statistics counter. Jeffrey whipped one up, but also screen share. So I do have a little bit of help with my systems team. Um, unfortunately, with our other kind of reference and instruction librarians, they also have their tasks. So collaborating with them hasn't happened as much. But thankfully, I do have the support of those like Jeffrey. We have no IT. <laughs> like I'm the, ooh, the little small library that doesn't have anything. So um, I, ooh, yes. Um, so I lean very heavily on these uh, resources that are available in South Carolina. The, um, like I mentioned, the South Carolina Digital Library can host all of that. There are people in place that do all the back end maintenance and that. So for me, rather than try to figure out how to create a website and host it on our own campus when IT, never mind, we're not, we're not going down the ropes, y'all know. Um, but uh, it was a much better partnership for me to um, use them as a hosting platform. And again, it's much more open, it's much more discoverable, and we don't have to worry about, oh, we have a new chancellor and they're going to overhaul the website again. Um, so that's been where, you know, it's the partnership has worked for me. Um, I don't really have any other librarians in our library that um, have either the time or the inclination on, in all honesty, um, to partner on things. So um, it's been a very slow build um, on my, and my campus is just starting to ramp up, trying to um, create a digital humanities situation, which I've also been roped into. So I'm hoping that some of this um, project work that I've done and some of these examples that Autumn has provided um, are a springboard to you know, we really need to hire a digital, a digital humanities librarian. We need a librarian who has like the um, tech background. Um, so like there are these gaping holes in our staffing in our library that really prevent us from doing a lot of the things that I want to do, which is why I need to say no more often. <laughs> Other we're done. We're out. We're done. Thank, Thank you all you. so much for coming. <laughs>